Rennick from the Constitution Unit, and I'm your chair for the next 90 minutes or so. Um, and citizens' assemblies have been of great interest to me and to the unit for quite some time. Uh, we, in 2015, with Graham Smith and others, helped organise the UK's first uh, citizens' assemblies at a local level. And then in 2017, we, Graham and Sarah, Alan and I and others, organised the citizens' assembly on Brexit, which was the first UK-wide uh, citizens' assembly. Um, and to me, citizens' assemblies are really important because I think we have a real need in the UK to develop a way of doing politics that's more inclusive and also more thoughtful. And citizens' assemblies seem at least to be a really good way of doing that. Now, in the early years, um, interest in citizens' assemblies was a fairly niche uh, concern. But over the last year, and really over the last six months, actually, uh, interest in citizens' assemblies has hugely increased. So the first official citizens' assembly in the UK was held last year uh, on, on uh, social care, a citizens' assembly organised by two Commons uh, select committees. Um, this year, the Scottish Government is holding a citizens' assembly. The Welsh Assembly is holding a citizens' assembly. Assembly. Uh, the UK Parliament, six uh, committees within uh, the House of Commons, have announced a Citizens' Assembly on climate change. The UK government is uh, sponsoring a number of deliberative events at a local level that look quite like Citizens' Assemblies, uh, and a number of local councils are also organising um, citizens' assemblies on climate change. Indeed, the first of those is due to get going, if all is well, in 36 minutes uh, in Camden. Uh, so um, democratic progress is happening as we're here in the room. And indeed, uh, as you'll be aware, many people, uh, Stella Creasy, Caroline Lucas, Rory Stewart, Damon Albarn, uh, Rowan Williams, and many others have argued that a citizens' assembly is needed in order to break the Brexit impasse over the coming period. So citizens' assemblies are very much in the news, and we need to consider important questions to do with these citizens' assemblies. In particular, what are they good for? What are they not good for? In what, ex in what circumstances might they work and not work? Um, and what are the key principles that ought to be followed in designing them? So we have a crack panel here to explore these issues. Um, we have, uh, in no particular order, uh, and not the order that they're sitting there, uh, Sarah Allen uh, with the dark hair, uh, who is head of engagement at Evol Involve. Um, and Sarah is the country's leading practitioner of citizens' assemblies. She designed and led our citizens' assembly on Brexit. Um, she played the same role in last year's citizens' assembly on social care. And she's doing the same again in Wales this summer. Graham Smith is Professor of Politics uh, at uh, the University of Westminster, and he's the country's leading scholar of citizens' assemblies and deliberative democracy. More broadly, he's the author of the seminal book on the subject, Democratic Innovations, and he's been deeply involved in many of the projects that I've just mentioned. Joanna Cherry is MP for Edinburgh Southwest and the SNP's Justice and Home Affairs spokesperson at Westminster, and she's been one of the main advocates for a citizens' assembly in Scotland. And Lillian Greenwood is MP for Nottingham South and Chair of the House of Commons Transport Committee, which is one of the six committees that are organising the Citizens' Assembly on Climate Change. And um, I hear she's been one of the key people pushing uh, for the idea of uh, having Citizens' Assemblies organised by Parliament. Joanna, alas, has a diary clash, which means that she will have to leave us in just a few minutes' time. Uh, so she's going to speak first, uh, and uh, hopefully we'll have time for a bit of Q&A with Joanna before she has to leave. And then we'll hear from Sarah, and then Lillian, and finally Graham. Um, I've asked each speaker to speak for no more than 10 minutes, so hopefully we'll have a good amount of time for Q&A at the end. So, Joanna, over to you. Well, good evening, everyone, and my apologies that I have to leave so abruptly after the Q&A session. Um, I'm very grateful to have been invited along here. I feel like a bit of a Citizens' Assembly imposter or ingenue because it's really something that I only got interested in very recently. Uh, earlier this year, I attended a conference uh, which... Um, 
Graham and Alan were also at, at the Bonavero Institute of Human Rights uh, in Oxford, where we looked at the constitutional future of the UK, but there was a lot of discussion about the possibility of a citizens' assembly. And uh, myself and a friend of mine called Leslie Riddick, who's a journalist and commentator, also part of the independence movement in Scotland, we became very excited about the idea of a citizens' assembly in Scotland and uh, advocated for it. And I laid a motion for enrolled a motion to be heard at the SNP conference in the spring, suggesting that the Scottish Government should hold a citizens' assembly. The motion was rather preempted by the First Minister deciding to pick up the ball and run with it, and we are now quite far advanced in our preparations for a citizens' assembly in the autumn. I say our preparations, it's very much the preparations of my colleagues in the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament. So I just thought I'd say a little bit about what's going to be happening in Scotland. I was at an event in Parliament recently run by the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Deliberative Democracy where David Farrell from University College Dublin spoke and he's been advising along with others the Scottish Government um, about this as he was very involved in the Irish Citizens Assembly and he reminded us that Ireland's Citizens Assembly and the precursor of the Constitutional Convention were born out of a time of crisis in the Republic of Ireland after the financial crash in 2008. And really, at present, Scotland also faces a time of crises, the same constitutional crisis that we're all facing across the United Kingdom and indeed in, in the north and the south of Ireland because of Brexit, but also an additional layer in Scotland in that what has happened as a result of the Brexit referendum very much brings to the fore in Scotland again some of the questions that some people thought had been answered perhaps even for a generation in the independence referendum of 2014. The promise that Scotland was an equal partner in the UK seems not to be the case, given that Scotland voted Remain but has had no say in the negotiations. And also it was a big part of the No campaign in Scotland, the No to Independence campaign, that the only way for people living in Scotland to guarantee their EU citizenship was to vote to remain part of the United Kingdom. Unfortunately, that's turned out not to be true. So the background to the Citizens' Assembly project in Scotland is that there's a majority of members of the Scottish Parliament in favour of holding a second independence referendum. And according to a poll in the Sunday Times yesterday, a majority of people in Scotland now want an early second independence referendum and a majority would vote yes if there was a no-deal Brexit or a Johnson prime ministership. Um, so that's the background against which this has happened. And at the end of April, the First Minister made an announcement saying that she was doing three things. She was bringing forward legislation in the Scottish Parliament to put on the table the option of holding a second independence its referendum, although the majority, the, the, the official view and, and the gold standard is, of course, that we would need a Section 30 order from the British Parliament to do that. She said that she was also going to hold cross-party talks with the other parties in the Scottish Parliament who don't want independence for them to put forward suggestions about how the powers of the Scottish Parliament could be increased. And she said that she was going to hold a citizens' uh, assembly. And uh, Mike Russell, who's our Cabinet Secretary for Constitutional Affairs and Brexit, made an announcement to the Scottish Parliament last week about the stage at which the planning for the uh, Citizens' Assembly has reached. The good news is that it looks like the cross-party talks will get off um, the, the ground. Um, uh, the um, Labour Party, the Greens, as you would expect, the Labour Party, and the Tories in Scotland have agreed to cross-party talks. Only the Liberal Democrats have declined the opportunity so far because they want independence taken off the table before those cross-party talks, which is rather unlikely to happen. Um, uh, the referendum legislation is sort of chugging through the Scottish Parliament, but the Citizens' Assembly is going to happen in uh, the autumn. And uh, the Scottish Parliament had a couple of weeks ago the secretaries of the Irish Constitutional Convention and Irish Citizens' Assembly in Holyrood speaking to ministers and, and MSPs about, um, the, about what the Irish Citizens' Assembly and Constitutional Convention in, uh, involved. And the tender has gone out uh, for the process of sortition to select 120 people um, to take part in the Citizens' Assembly, and it's been decided that there should be two co-conveners uh, with the gender balance, one male, one female, and the, the 
one of the co-conveners has been appointed, and he is a former Labour member of the European Parliament, a highly respected individual called uh, David Martin, who was a Labour member of the European Parliament for, I think, since 1984, a former Vice President of the European Parliament. So he's been appointed as one convener. I'm not sure who the other convener is going to be because I'm a lawyer. I was pushing behind the scenes for a judge or a senior lawyer as they had in Ireland, but I think my colleagues think that I always want a lawyer to do everything, so I'm not sure if, if they'll uh, go with that. Um, another thing, so basically it's, it's going to happen in the autumn. It's going to take place over six sessions in the autumn through to the spring. Uh, 120 citizens will be selected. A broad aim of the Citizens' Assembly has been announced, but it has been decided that the citizens themselves, in work with the conveners, will focus the remit, which I think might be a little bit controversial uh, compared uh, to uh, the way it was done in Ireland. But some very important principles uh, have been laid down, that the Citizens' Assembly will be completely independent from government, including through the, uh, the appointment of the uh, conveners and arm's length secretary secretariat and expert advisory groups. When I say arm's length, the secretariat will be located outside the Scottish Government. Um, the principle of transparency will apply at all levels of the operation, the assembly from the framing of the questions to the selection of members and expert witnesses will be a transparent uh, process uh, which will involve um, proactive pub publication of submissions and importantly live streaming of the deliberative uh, sessions. Um, um, uh, access the public, the principle that the public must be able to see and comment upon the work of the Assembly and stakeholders must feel that they and their interests have a route into the Assembly. Um, balance, cumulative learning, open-mindedness, uh, these are some of the other principles that have been said to underlie um, the Assembly. The role of the conveners will be extremely important. They will be responsible for stewarding, convening and representing the Assembly. But at the heart of the Assembly will be its members. The tender for recruitment went out on the 14th of, of June and 120 members of the public will be randomly selected. And the tender is designed to ensure that the membership will be broadly representative of Scotland's adult population according to age, ethnic groups, socio-economic background, geography and political attitude. And importantly, members will be drawn from those eligible to vote under the new franchise. Now there's legislation going through the Scottish Parliament at the moment to extend uh, the franchise to refugees and asylum seekers in Scotland. So it won't just be people living in Scotland and EU nationals. It will be a bit wider than that, as I understand it. Um, the remit is possibly the most controversial uh, area, and if I tell you that the um, the Greens and some the Greens are supporting it along with the SNP, the Scottish Labour Party have given it a cautious welcome, but the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats are very unhappy about the Citizens Assembly, and say they're not going to support it because they see it to quote as part of the project of furthering independence. Now. When the First Minister first announced it was going to happen, she said it would look at three broad questions. What kind of country are we seeking to build? How best can we overcome the challenges we face, including those arising from Brexit? And what further work should be carried out to give people the detail they need and to make informed choices about the future? Now, my colleague Mike Russell, the Cabinet Secretary, announced last week that there was going to have to be more discussion about the remit in, their, in his engagement with experts and practitioners. I think they have suggested that perhaps the remit could be better focused, and that's something that is going to be looked at over the the summer before the um, uh, Citizens' Assembly commences. Now, of course, as you'll, as you'll probably know, in Ireland, the Citizens' Assembly has looked at a number of topics, and speaking of somebody with an Irish mum from an Irish Catholic background, I reckon if the Citizens' Assembly in Ireland can solve the problem of abortion to the satisfaction of the majority of people who voted in the subsequent referendum, then I have very high hopes that a Citizens' Assembly in Scotland uh, can um, deal with topics which are perhaps equally 
controversial in uh, the Scottish context. So I, I've got great hopes for it, and so, so does my colleague, the minister, who's driving it in Scotland, and he's very much hoping that perhaps this assembly that takes place over the autumn to the spring will be, will be the first of many if it proves to be a successful uh, project. But importantly, the government has also given a commitment to making sure that the recommendations are fed back through the Scottish Parliament in a, a proper process. So I'm very happy to answer any questions that may follow as a result of what I've said. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Joanna. So um, we have, I think, nine minutes before uh, you, you have to uh, rush off. So um, let me just ask you uh, two questions um, and while others are thinking. Um, so I'm, uh, the case for a citizens' assembly in Scotland seems to me very strong in that you know, Scotland has this huge decision in front of it. Um, the Scottish government presumably really wants that if uh, Scots vote for independence, the process that then follows is not like the process that has followed the vote for Brexit. Um, and therefore, thinking through what should happen after, after such a vote is really, really important, and a citizens' assembly would seem to be a good way of helping to do that. Um, two questions, though. Firstly, what happens if the citizens' assembly says, actually, we don't want a referendum on independence, we don't want independence? What, what does the Scottish government then do? And secondly, you said that the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats <coughs> are not supporting this process. So the Conservatives, of course, are the second party in Scotland at the moment. So is it possible for this really to work without the support of the second largest party in Scotland? Okay. Um, gosh, I'm always rubbish. Is that better? I'm always hopeless at using these things. Yeah, I think that's it. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Luckily I've got a loud voice. Um, well, the purpose of the Citizens' Assembly in Scotland is not to decide whether or not Scotland will become an independent country. That will be done by a second independence referendum, the precedent having been established. Uh, clearly we face a bit of a problem at the moment because we haven't got a Section 30 order and we can't hold a referendum without one, that being the gold standard. Uh, however, this government at present doesn't look particularly stable, and we are fairly confident that its position in relation to a Section 30 order will become unsustainable, particularly as support for independence rises. But the purpose of the Assembly is categorically not to decide whether or not Scotland will become an independent country. So the Assembly will deal with the remit that I've described. Now, I know some people would say the remit should be more focused. Some people have suggested that perhaps a Citizens' Assembly could look at something as solid as the topic of what currency a future Scotland, an independent Scotland, might use, quite a fraught topic in the independence debate in Scotland. But importantly, any recommendations it makes will be put back into the Parliament and will be fed through the democratic process. So I don't expect it to say we don't want independence, because if it represents a political cross-section of Scotland, it's highly unlikely to say that. Um, uh, anything it says will have to be looked at carefully. I think that's the commitment that the Scottish Government have made. Yes, it is very unfortunate that the uh, Tories, who are the second party in Scotland, are not supporting it. But when, it, when we say they're the second party, they have, I think, about half the seats that the SNP have. The SNP, together with the Greens and the Scottish Labour Party, make up by far, the, by far I think, about two-thirds majority of the Scottish Parliament, so it's un and the Lib Dems will only have a handful of seats, so it's unfortunate that they're not coming on board. Of course, it would be great if they came on board. They may yet change their mind as matters progress, but I think the situation that Scotland's in at present, the fact that a minority of parties in the Scottish Parliament are not supporting it, can't stop us from doing it, or shouldn't stop us from doing it. Okay, thank you. Let's open it up to further questions to Joanna, and I can see three, so uh, I can see four. Let's quickly take those four and see how, how far you can get. Um, so the first question was here. If you can say who you are, um, that would be very helpful. I'm Heather Rolfe from Lisa. Um, so I'm not really very familiar with the way that citizens' assemblies work, but you said that they would be live streamed. And so I'm wondering, because obviously in a focus group situation, you would guarantee people anonymity. So yeah. how do you ensure that people speak openly, honestly, and you know, without kind of um, you know, being fearful that people will see what they said and, and disagree? And Good. Let's group the questions. So, <coughs> but good question. Uh, gentleman here? Yeah. yeah. 
Barbara Jackson from the Sortition Foundation. Um, I want to know, uh, in, in knowledge, with the, the two committees from the, the first uh, Citizens Assembly on Adult Social Care, where the two committees requested from the government that they respond to the CA's recommendations with any given time frames. We still haven't had any response from the Hancock's department on them. Their, their uh, recommendations for... Um, I don't think they change currently. Um, my point being that in the run up to the Irish Citizens Assembly, there was evidence that polling suggested that um, abortion was a changing issue and that support had been growing in the run up to it. Yeah. Uh, there was one here as well. Yes. Yes. Question. I should have made clear that not all, not the deliberative sessions. They won't be, they won't be live streamed. It will be the plenaries that are live streamed. I'll leave the experts, such as Sarah, to maybe deal with the question of anonymity or not anonymity. I think one of the things I've discussed, I've heard discussed at other events I've been at, is protecting members of the citizens' assembly from the pressures that can be brought to bear on individuals by the media and by social media. But I'll leave the experts. Um, to deal with that. On the second question, well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to give myself the burden of answering for the Matt Hancock or, or, or the Tories, but uh, Mike Russell's given a very firm commitment that these proposals will be fed into the Scottish Parliament and, and looked at properly. I'm not sure a timescale has been given. Um, on the question of abortion, I suppose I referred to my Irish Catholic mother, she'd probably kill me for doing so if this has been live streamed, insofar as I was trying to <coughs> recommend that coming from a sort of Catholic background, although I'm a lapsed Catholic, I understand that coming from an Irish background, I understand how difficult it was for Irish politicians to talk about that issue. It was very difficult to take a position without alienating a big chunk of your electorate. And I think, I, I'm, I, I can't say for certain, but I've no doubt that opinion would have been changing in Ireland and the way that opinion has changed in modern Ireland, I certainly know my generation, the generation below me and my family hold very different views from my parent, from my mum's generation in relation to issues like equal marriage and abortion. But as I understand it, there were people on that Citizens' Assembly in Ireland who changed their position like kind of older Irish ladies like my mum who would have been regular mass goers and very genuine in the views that they held but they heard testimony from young women who'd had to come to England to get an abortion or carry a, a, dead, a dead baby to full term to give birth and I think these testimonies changed people's views and so people actually moved and I don't expect the Scottish Citizens' Assembly will be discussing an issue quite as personal as abortion, but I think what it indicates is that people's views change. And I also understand that some people who got involved in the Irish Citizens' Assembly became so involved that they've gone on and are now active, not necessarily in party politics, but community politics and as community uh, advocates. Uh, on the question of the 120, the Irish Citizens' Assembly, although that would be credited if I'm wrong, had 99 members and the convener who was an Irish Supreme Court judge, a woman I'm, I'm glad to say. As I understand it, the Scottish one's going to have 100 as well, but I think they're going for 120, a bit like the sort of alternate jurors system they have in America, which I've always found an outrage as a lawyer, but I think to have, to have reserves. But I'm not completely sure about that, and again, I suspect that's something that will be clarified by uh, those who have an expertise in this. As I said at the beginning of my speech, I feel like a bit of an imposter, as this is something I've become enthused about in, in the last six months. But I really do hold the view that it's a really powerful thing. And I know some Scottish local authorities have had small mini-publics and small citizens' juries, equally some of the Scottish parliamentary committees, their equivalent of the SEC of the select committees down here have held some small mini publics and citizens juries and I just think it's a really important way to break out of the bind that we get into in party politics uh, and have sort of freer thinking 
then parliaments, it's like parliaments ought to be able to do, accept, uh, achieve this degree of free thinking. And I think the select committees do. I think that's one of the best things about parliament is the select committees, because you have people from different parties who hear expert evidence and alliances form across party lines. But I think, you know, the Citizens' Assembly takes it out of the party system completely, but with the ultimate democratic check of them reporting back into the parliament. Great. Thank you so much, Joanna. I fear you have to leave now. I really must apologise very sincerely for having to leave. It seems awfully rude, but I do have a previous engagement that I can't miss. But I'm really grateful to have been invited and sorry to miss other people's well, contributions. We're very grateful thank to you. you for having come here. So thank you very, very much. So we uh, move on now to the rest of the panel, and if anyone is wondering what actually is a Citizens' Assembly, then um, Sarah is going to tell us. Ed, are you happy for Sarah to go there? My choice, I will stay, ooh, I will stay here if that isn't going to be too echoey. Um, also, I believe Paul at the front had an answer to the gentleman's question about the Citizens' Assembly on Social Care. Do, can I give him a chance to answer oh, yes, it? Okay. Um, so, um, just to say that no, the government has not yet published its promised green paper on paying for social care. So there has been no response to this. Good. Thank you, Paul. Not good. Not good. Yes. <laughs> If it, it, I feel like this mic is perhaps a bit echoey. If it's causing people a problem in hearing me, I'll go and stand up. So just somebody wave at me at some point. So um, what is a Citizens' Assembly then? Well, a Citizens' Assembly is a type of uh, public engagement process uh, known as a mini-public. And mini-publics have certain characteristics. Um, so the first one is that they bring together a representative sample of the population, usually in terms of age, gender, ethnicity, social class and place of residence, so where in the country someone lives, um, and often in addition to that in terms of attitude. So for example on the Citizens' Assembly uh, in Brexit that we ran together, it was what their vote had been in the 2016 referendum, so more leavers than remainers. In the Citizens' Assembly on Social Care it was to do with people's attitude to a small or large state because it was all about how money should be where money should come from and how it should be spent and so on. So an attitudinal question if it's relevant to the topic and important um, that the group of people is representative in that way. Um, so you have a representative sample of the public um, and then they go through a three-step process. So they go through a process of learning about an issue. I'm going to talk about more about this in a minute. A process of learning, a process of deliberation or discussion with one another and a process of decision uh, during which they come up with a set of recommendations or conclusions. So that's how, how many publics work. A citizens' assembly is a type of mini public. Um, generally speaking, you'd expect it to have between 50 and 150 roughly participants. There's a bit of disagreement about that, but that's, that's what I'd say roughly. Um, in terms of length, they have been as short as three days, but generally speaking, they're usually two weekends or longer. That's generally what we're talking about. So I'm going to say a bit more detail now about each of those um, characteristics and a little bit on how they're facilitated as well. Um, so firstly on recruitment, I've talked about how people uh, are representative, but not how you do that. Um, so there's many different ways to recruit for a citizens' assembly. Um, the kind of gold standard way of doing it is something called a civic lottery. And what that involves is selecting a number of households, um, usually off the postcode database if it's done in this country, and sending them a letter inviting them to be part of the Citizens' Assembly. So we're running the one in Wales at the moment, um, as Alan said. Um, that's got 60 participants, letters went to 10,000 households. You send out the letters, people reply, there's lots of different ways in which they can reply. That gives you a pool of people, many more than you need. And from there, you take a stratified sample according to those characteristics that you want to get your final number of participants. So that's how that works. Um, participants are also, I should say, um, we need to make sure the assembly is accessible. So participants are incentivised. So we would generally pay people £150 per weekend uh, in order to take part. Um, we also make sure, for example, that if people need their childcare covered or need respite care covered or need to bring a carer with them, um, that that is all possible to enable the broadest possible range of people to take part. And similar things around if people need braille and, and so on and so forth. So that's the recruitment works. Um, when you get to the assembly then, your three stages um, of the assembly. So the learning part of the assembly is divided into two sections. The first part is back 
background learning, so about the topic. So for the Citizens' Assembly on Social Care, um, what is social care? How does the social care funding system currently work? Why, do people, why are people saying there's a crisis? Why, why are we here discussing this issue at all? That kind of thing. And people get to ask questions to the experts who present that information. And the idea of that is that you have a kind of level playing field that everyone is then able to understand the information that comes afterwards, and it works very well for that. The second part of the learning phase, then, is when people hear people arguing what different answers to the question that they've been posed are. So if the question, as in the case of the Citizens' Assembly on Social Care, was how do we fund adult social care in England sustainably long term, they hear from everybody, who's, well, not from everybody, but they hear from a like, people who together represent the range of answers to that topic, hear them argue it themselves, And they get to question them as well. That's what I wanted to say. Um, so a lot of effort goes into how you get that to be as balanced as possible. So you have your expert leads, who are usually experts in the subject matter, who are respected by this range of stakeholders involved as being people who are really evidence-based and try to be balanced in how they approach things. But you can never, you know, two people, as much as they're trying to be balanced, some things can slip in. So you also have an advisory panel uh, made up of key stakeholders and people with different opinions who check everything that the leads do and check the information that's going to the assembly and who's going to speak. And then if you're doing something where it's commissioned by parliament or another body, obviously the commissioning body is also checking everything. So you have a number of layers of checks there to make that evidence as balanced as it can possibly be. And you also give people the same length of time to speak and all of this kind of thing. From that, you then have the deliberation, so that's structured, so you give people tasks like writing pros and cons of different, different um, ideas that they've heard, maybe uh, ordering something in terms of preference. Now, those things don't matter. We might capture that for analysis, but it's really just to get people to start to think things through and really discuss them with each other at their tables. Um, and then you go to the process of decision, which is usually done ultimately by voting. So that's how it works. Um, a bit on how you facilitate it. So if you walked into a citizens' assembly, let's start there, what would you see? Well, you'd see a number of tables, depending on the number of participants. You'd probably see about seven or eight uh, members of the assembly at each table. There'd be a facilitator on each table. There'd be a couple of lead facilitators at the front, probably with your expert leads. You'd notice that there was a real diversity of people on each table, and that's because we do a seating plan. Because otherwise, you have a diversity of people coming, and then everybody, I don't know, all the young people sit together, which isn't the point at all. So you, you have a seating plan. So the point when you are facilitating citizens' assemblies, so if you're at the tables or you're at the front, you know, it's got multiple points and some of them are obvious, so um, I guess people knowing what they're meant to be doing at any one time, uh, people, the conversation happening in a respectful, respectful manner and so on. But one of the key ones is to make sure that everyone in the room can participate equally. And you use various techniques for that. So there is no point in having this great diversity of people there if everyone with a university education, for example, speaks 10 times more than everybody else. Um, so you use facilitation techniques for that. So, for example, if participants were going to ask uh, an expert some questions, instead of saying, you know, put your hand up if you want to ask a question, and then only very few people actually doing that, you get everybody in the room to write down the questions they'd like to ask. They then share that back with their table, what they've written, and tables prioritise the questions, and then the facilitator at their table actually asks those prioritised questions for the speaker. And these two, I did, and, and uh, people who work with them, did some amazing analysis. Um, of, they recorded all the conversations that happened at the Citizens' Assembly on Brexit at the tables. Then they went through and worked out who was speaking when. Um, and they added it up, and they found that there was no statistically significant difference in how long people spoke for by any of the criteria that we recruited on. Not by age, not by gender, not by social class, not by ethnicity, not by place of residence, not by how they voted in the referendum either. And that is exactly what you're aiming for with facilitation. How long have I been talking for? Uh, seven minutes. Seven minutes, three minutes. Excellent. Um, so I have a slight confession. So there was a second thing I was meant to talk about, right, which is when a citizens' assembly is a good idea. I noticed that when I walked into the room. So this might not be my most intelligent answer to that question ever, but to give it a go. So if that's what they are, when are they a good idea? Um, well, they're, they're, right, they're a good idea if you're looking at the right type of issue. Um, so these might be issues that are politically stuck. Um, so if you like social care funding, where essentially someone's going to have to pay for social care and parties have become worried about putting out a policy and sticking to that policy because they always get backlash from whoever it is who's going to end up paying climate change. People may be worried about you know, exactly 
what steps we should be taking in order to address climate change because actually people are going to notice and people might mind. So it's got a bit politically stuck. That's a good type of issue. Um, systems that are also often used on moral issues, so abortion in Northern Ireland being a case in point, gay marriage in Northern Ireland being a case in point, um, and also on constitutional issues. So they've been done on electoral reform. The one we're doing Wales in Wales at the moment is how people should be able to shape their future through the National Assembly for Wales. That's also about kind of constitutional structures and processes. So those sorts of issues are good ones. And generally, you're looking for issues that are complex. This is the thing, because citizens' assemblies produce multiple outputs. So on the social care assembly, for example, there wasn't a single output. People produced a list of principles that should underpin any new fund system for funding social care. Then they produced their view on a range of questions. So if social care was going to be publicly funded, which of a range of ways of doing that, you know, local tax, inheritance tax, etc, 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 would be their preference. Um, they produced a view on which, if it was going to be privately funded, as in by private individuals, what would their preferred way be of doing that? Um, and then they produced uh, a view on whether it should be publicly funded or privately funded and what the balance should be between the two. And within that, there was all sorts of things about whether people's houses should be included, uh, whether there should be a cap on what individuals have to pay, uh, and so on and so on. They produced views on all of those things that the committee could use and their reasons for why. So you get this wealth of things. If you've got an incredibly simple decision, it is not worth running a citizens' assembly on it. It is overkill massively. Do something much simpler. Um, so the issue has to be right. The second thing that needs to be right is the political situation, the politics around it. Um, so there's much I could say about that, but uh, I think one of the most obvious things is that citizens' assemblies are a good... They don't magically make a difference. This is, this is, I think, what I'm trying to get at. They don't magically make a difference. Politicians have to pick up the results and do something with them. So you want to run a citizens' assembly when there is political appetite for doing something about the issue, and then ideally when you've got cross-party buy-in for running something on a topic. If you don't have that, there is a risk that you run the Citizens' Assembly and nothing happens. Um, thirdly, um, it's good to have a clear question. You don't have to have it right at the start. People like us can work with people to, to come up with a clear question that the Assembly is addressing, but you will need that ultimately. Um, and I think lastly, you need the right amount of time. You know, These things take time to recruit people, um, to set up, to organise, you need to have enough time to run it and also enough budget to run it and to run a process that is long enough for the issue that's being considered. Citizens' assemblies are in different, a different length because they deal with different complexities of issues. People have to hear different quantities of evidence. That's what determines the length of the assembly and you need to have the time and the budget to match that. <coughs> and if I have forgotten something, I'm sure Graham and Alan will fully pick me up on it and say it later. Great. Thank you very much, Sarah. <laughs> That was a fantastic overview. Uh, so now we turn to our next, <coughs> sorry, next speaker who's who's uh, doing one of these citizens assemblies, Lillian Greenwood from the Commons Transport Committee, chair of the Commons Transport Committee. Um, so I must speak from here as well, as we're, that's what we're doing. Um, okay, so. I'll try next. I feel like a bit of an inexpert because we're at an early stage, but I'll, I'll talk and then if I don't take 10 minutes, then we'll have loads more time for uh, questions and discussion. I think if I want to say first, so Alan said at the beginning that, you know, why is there, any, why is there an interest in citizens' assemblies? And Alan said it's a way of doing politics that's more inclusive and more thoughtful. Um, and I, thought I had a real good example. As I was leaving Parliament um, to come over here, there were two groups of citizens standing outside. One group of them were shouting, and excuse my language, fuck Brexit. And the other group were shouting, we want Brexit. And there was, it was a conversation um, in which no one was listening and no one was seeking to try to understand the view of the other. have been trying to get out of Westminster as part of our uh, inquiries, are trying to be uh, hold open public engagement sessions where people can come and ask us about our work and tell us what they think about the issues that we're uh, tackling. But a, but a citizens' assembly is a far more uh, systematic um, and intensive way of, of doing that. I think the third reason is because, as has already been mentioned, there's been a Citizens' Assembly on funding uh, social care, jointly commissioned by two of the uh, parliamentary select committees. And I think, generally, that's been seen as a positive. Um, there's a sense that it, were, it provided valuable evidence to the committee's joint inquiry into what is a very 
knotty, long-standing issues, I think you've also heard that it isn't a panacea, because as with many select committee uh, pieces of work, when you get the government's response, generally within a couple of months, it isn't always what um, you want to hear. They don't always take all those uh, issues forward. But I think it's seen, it was seen as a valuable process, and therefore other select committees are now thinking, how can we learn? Because select committees are evolving things. Um, I haven't thought of this till now, but maybe it could be fashionable. That might be one of the reasons. Um, I think the positive reason why we're interested in it is that it is a way of confronting people with hard choices and trying to get them to look at those hard choices from an informed uh, perspective. So I think that, that's a really important part of the process, is saying, right, what, what's the evidence out there? What, what, what do What's, what's, the, what's the data, what's the hard facts, um, and then when you've got that information, when you've been done some of that learning, what, what sort of things does that make you choose uh, to do? And I think the sort of follow-on from that is, of course, that it can help government ministers to make difficult choices and to tackle difficult issues because they've got a sense of where the public are on this. What would feel fair? What would feel acceptable? How do you tackle some of the knotty difficult problems and objections that will come up, you've got a bit of an idea of them. And I think also, as we've also heard today, it's been used in other countries and perhaps the one that most people are most familiar with, even if they know not very much about the whole idea of citizens' assemblies, is they've heard what happened in the Republic of Ireland and they've seen things that were long-standing difficult issues uh, tackled, such as abortion or same-sex uh, marriage. So let me just say a, a little bit about the, what the, the role the, the six select committees uh, are doing. And maybe I, I'm, I'm going to—I don't want to assume that the whole audience know what select committees do generally and what we are. So we're groups of MPs. We're made up in the same proportions as in the House of Parliament. So we're cross-party and we're, at the moment, because of the makeup of the House of Parliament, very balanced. So on my transport committee, so I'm the elected chair of it, there are 10 members and we have equal numbers of Labour members and Conservative members, so for each of the two main parties. And we've got one DUP member and one SNP member. So that makes us very... Uh, very cross-party, very evenly balanced. We are a parliamentary committee. We're not appointed by the government. We're not appointed by uh, the whips of the, of the different parties where they're elected by the individual parties. Um, and we decide our own work. So we can choose what things we want to look at rather than anybody else uh, deciding. Um, and we proceed, uh, and, and our job is to scrutinise the government, the relevant government department. So in the case of transport, our job is to scrutinise the Department for Transport. That means we look at the policies that they are pursuing, we look at their, their administration, how well are they doing it, and we look at what money are they spending. Um, so it gives us kind of a wide range of things to, to pick, out, pick on uh, and look at. Now, just to, the, to draw the, the, I just wanted to make clear really, which is that I think citizens' assemblies feel like quite a natural thing for select committees to pursue because actually it's very similar to the work that we do all the time because a select committee inquiry generally proceeds in this way, which is we put out a call for evidence. We ask people to tell us what they think about a particular issue and most of the people who will respond to our call for evidence will generally be people who consider themselves experts or stakeholders. But sometimes we get huge amounts of uh, evidence from members of the public. And an example is at the right at the moment, we're doing a, an inquiry into pavement parking. We've had 400 responses, some of them from the usual people you'd expect, the Association of British Drivers, the organisation that organises pedestrians. But then we would like had hundreds, literally, from ordinary citizens going, look at the state of my street, and here's a photo of people parking on the pavement, and this is what it means to me. So it's not unusual in that sense. Then we interrogate the evidence. We hold these oral evidence sessions where we get experts in and ask them questions and get them to explain things to us in more detail. Then we discuss the evidence, we deliberate on it, and we come up with conclusions and recommendations. And we make those to government. And they might agree with us, and sometimes they might implement our recommendations. They do respond to our reports, generally within two months. But they don't always do anything with it. So in that sense, uh, no change there. 
So what are we doing on climate change? So there are six select committees coming together. I think it's, this is pretty ambitious. We tried, we've done a, a report uh, across four committees. We did one into air quality a couple of years ago. Um, this time we're bringing together business energy and industrial strategy, environmental audit committee, commu housing communities and local government, science and technology, treasury and transport, my own uh, committee. And the idea is to pick up on uh, what's already been said about that, where there's a cross-party agreement. So you know that Parliament has said that we are going to have to be net zero carbon by 2050. And the purpose of this Citizens' Assembly is to look at how can we combat climate change and achieve the pathway uh, to net zero carbon emissions. So in other words, Parliament's made that decision, but what are the things that we should do to actually... Uh, get us there. I think it's a huge question to ask, so it's pretty ambitious. Um, but the idea is to establish a consensus around and public support around uh, the the changes, pr pretty radical changes maybe, that are required if we're going to actually uh, deliver net zero and hope, I guess, that that will help ministers to make the case for making those uh, policy changes. The Citizens' Assembly we're going to do is going to be funded by the Houses of Parliament from the research uh, budget, but we might get matched funding from the third sector. Um, an outside contractor is going to be recruited by competitive tender to actually uh, deliver the work. The select committees, the six of us, will have an input into selecting what the questions are. Given the size of the topic and the amount of money and time available, we'll probably have to be pretty focused. Um, but once, um, but we won't take part once the um, we won't take part in selecting the contractor, and we won't be taking part in guiding the assembly once it's established. But we'll just be setting some uh, questions. The output will be a report of the findings, and then committees will use that in their work or in their future reports. And as I understand it, there'll be an accompanying online conversation to capture wider uh, public views. The last few things I wanted to say. First of all, is this is relatively new territory for us. Um, as I said already, we do try to involve the public and hear from uh, the public in our work. Citizens' Assembly is one tool, but I think there's a lot of interest in it. I think that we do recognise the importance of hearing from the public. Sometimes when, when you question the public, you hear things that you would never in the small group of you, because only 10, uh, necessarily have heard and don't always hear from even expert groups about people's own lived experience, and I think that's hugely valuable. We're still at an early stage of developing this piece of work, so I think we've got further to go. Um, I think because it's innovative, we'll probably have to refine it, and it's a learning process, and it's not the end of it. Um, it might not work as well as we hope, and I think that's okay. Um, I think we should be able to get things not quite right and then learn from them and evolve. Um, as I've already said, the government might not act on our recommendations. It's not them who's um, commissioned the assembly. It's a, it's a group of select committees. Um, it's going to be quite costly as select committee works go. So if we're going to I'm guessing there'll be other select committees that go, I wish we'd thought of doing that, or, oh, no, there's no budget left. So there might be a question that we need to ask ourselves collectively as a group of select committees about how do we prioritise? Is this the right process? Should we have done something smaller, littler? What, you know, in, and in the future, maybe think about that. Um, I think there are strengths. There probably will be strengths and weaknesses about the, the way that it happens. And, and then the last thing, uh, to go back to things on the way over here. So as I was preparing for this evening, I was just scribbling some notes. I was in the, one of the lady members' rooms over at Parliament. Um, strange anachronism that are very good. Um, anyway, as I was writing some notes, some, another colleague, um, member of Parliament, not doesn't matter which party they were from, does it? Uh, came in uh, and she said, oh, what are you doing? Are you about to make a speech? I was like, yeah, but not in here, just over the road. And she said, oh, what are you talking about? I said, oh, talking about Citizens' Assembly. She said, oh, I don't like them at all. Um, so there you go. Uh, they're not necessarily going to be universally <laughs> accepted, um, but I think we're right to try it, and I think it'll be a really interesting process. Thanks. Great. Thank you.
fascinating. Thank you very much. And finally, we have Graham. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to say, uh, make a few um, disjointed uh, remarks because a lot of what I was going to say has already been said. But I, so I'll try not to try not to repeat. So we've got plenty of time. Um, first of all, something is clearly in the air. I mean, first of all, we've almost filled this room with people interested in citizens' assemblies. That wouldn't have happened six months ago. Um, I've, one of my favourite stories at the moment is I've been working on this stuff for 20 years, and for the first 19 and a half, no one showed any interest whatsoever. <laughs> so something, something has changed. And even in the last two weeks, the Citizens' Assembly, the Irish Citizens' Assembly, uh, the, the Irish government responded to the Irish Citizens' Assembly's um, recommendations on climate change within its, uh, within its report. The parliamentary committees said that they were going to run a citizens' assembly. An Extinction Rebellion reminded everybody that they want to have a citizens' assembly as well. I mean, everybody wants a citizens' assembly at the moment. So there's something, something interesting happening here. The second point I want to say is citizens' assembly has been mentioned. Citizens' assemblies are only one type of deliberative mini-public which brings together randomly selected citizens. There are consensus conferences, citizens' juries, deliberative opinion polls, G1000s. These things have been running since the 1970s. We know a lot about how they work. We, we haven't seen that many citizens' assemblies that, that are like 50 to 100 people that have run over that length, uh, the length of time that's happened in Ireland. But we have a lot of experience here. It's not something we've just invented. What are they good for? Just a couple of contributions on that. I think the most important thing they do is they bring the considered judgment of citizens into the political process. That's what I think they do. Um, and I don't think there's any other way that I can think of that is as effective as bringing that considered judgment to bear. Um, they are very good. There's, I, I won't repeat what my colleagues have said. Well, I will repeat a little bit, but not, I won't go into too much detail. They're very good at breaking political deadlocks. They're very good at dealing with trade-offs. They're dealing with challenging, controversial, and complex political issues. There is a sort of... Very often, people don't want to put things to citizens' assemblies because they're a bit worried about how they'll be dealt with. But our experience is the more controversial, the better in many ways. Actually, just a side story. When we were doing the citizens' assembly on Brexit, everyone said, don't talk about immigration. Just don't do it. So we did, and it was fine. We can talk some more about that. One thing is clear that you know, Ireland is a game changer here. Um, it has provided this political space for the acceptance amongst uh, the established, established political class. You know, I'm thinking about politicians, civil servants, to actually think that this, is a sense, that this could be a sensible thing to do. Uh, you couldn't get a hearing on this before the Irish Citizens' Assembly amongst many people. So there, we have to recognise that that's a game changer. I am very worried about what in academia we call institutional isomorphism basically copying, which means everybody wants a citizens' assembly now. Um, I'm really excited about what's happening in Scotland, but it's the first time that I've seen where um, people have the resources available to do it, the time to do it, the desire to do it, but they're not sure why they want to do it. They haven't quite got the question right. Usually it's the other way around. You have a question and then you try and fight for the resources to, to, um, to answer it through a citizen assembly. So there is something happening here, and I find it around climate change as well. Lots of local authorities wanting to run citizens assembly-like processes on climate change. Not entirely sure why, but they feel they want to be the first or one of the first to do it. So I think there are some really, really key things here. Two or three things I want to say about what makes a good assembly. One is a task a which has real clarity. And it can be a very controversial task. It can be a complex task, but one which has clarity, one which you, you know, will, will provide, which will deal with trade-offs, will actually uh, engage citizens in that way. Secondly, and I'm repeating what Sarah said, um, do you need time to answer that question? Uh, and one of the problems with the Irish Citizens Assembly on climate, uh, the Irish Citizens Assembly, is they spent six weeks on abortion, exactly the right amount of time, to my view, and then two weeks on climate change. There is no way that in two weeks you can deal with an issue as complex as climate change. I don't, I'm not at all saying they should have spent less time on abortion, but if you can deal with climate change, you aren't going to deal with it in two weeks. It's one of the reasons their recommendations haven't really had the impact that's required, that was required in that area. The, second is, the third issue is related to political impact. And if we're honest, most of these deliberative processes actually don't have that much impact. Um, they're not tied in, 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 into the political process. Now, what was interesting about Ireland is some of the issues the government agreed to put out to a referendum. And certain issues like abortion, like same-sex marriage, are things which are easy to have an, abor uh, an have, sorry, have a um, referendum on. Climate change isn't, for example. So how are you going to link that into the political process? Now, there's been some interesting innovation here. And I just want to talk about a two at the end, just to say, just to 
talk about every, because everyone's got Ireland in their minds uh, because that's the one everyone knows about. But I think there's been two or three really interesting innovations developed in, in um, citizens' assembly practice, some of which people on the table may or may not agree about. But one I think is really interesting in Poland, where the activist Marcin Gerwin is running citizens' assemblies with, lo with, with city councils. And there he gets the mayor to agree before the citizens' assembly recommendations come out. That if the citizens' assembly supports anything with 80% or above, the city mayor will implement it. So it's not just recommendatory. They've actually been empowered. Where there is near consensus within the citizens' assembly, where there's 80%, the mayor agrees beforehand that it will be implemented. Most people writing on citizens' assemblies say they should be only recommendatory. Um, I find it kind of bizarre that you spend all this time working, creating this careful environment within which citizens think about these things carefully, and then you put it out to a referendum which is where most people don't think about things you know, very, very carefully. Or you send it back into the government system, which was the place which had the political problems to start with. So I'm kind of quite sympathetic to what Marcin's doing, although it puts me, I guess, outside of the, um, outside of the sort of average thinking about this. So that's one thing. Secondly, a couple of really interesting examples coming to us from Belgium and from, from Madrid, where they've actually institutionalised citizens' assemblies. Most citizens' assemblies require the government or select committees or someone in political authority to say we need a citizens assembly which gives agenda setting power to which means they only happen when there's political will for them to happen in um, the German speaking parliament I didn't know there was a German speaking parliament in Belgium I learned that there was by going there which is a small um, a small region of about 70 to 80,000 uh, population they've now institutionalised citizens assemblies they have this thing called the citizens council which is a small group of randomly selected citizens who each year hear evidence from Parliament, from the government, and from civil society groups and citizens as to what they think a citizens' assembly should be held on. And that group decides, this year we're going to have a citizens' assembly on X, or a citizens' assembly on Y. And then the that then feeds into the relevant uh, parliamentary committee. So the decision on when and where and what it's going to be on is actually now a citizen body. Um, another example in Madrid, where they have a, a, a process by which um, citizens can um, put forward propositions from, through initiatives, and that citizens assembly then looks at that, they're calling it observatory, then looks at the, the, the um, initiative which had the highest, number of support, the, the highest number of signatories, and then puts forward a proposition. To, uh, puts forward a recommendation to, to the local city council on how to act and then can also choose other ones that they, that they think are worth looking at. And in Oregon, they now use citizens' assemblies. I know, I know that Alan's very interested in this. They now use citizens' assemblies in the citizens' initiative process where if someone um, gets forward... A, in, in Oregon, what you can do is if you can get a ballot with, a, I think it's 100,000 signatures, something like that, I can't remember how many it is, a threshold of signatures, that then goes to a ballot. If you win the ballot, it becomes law. One of the problems with that is people say, well, we just don't have the information knowing how to act. So they put a citizen's assembly, well, it's a citizen's jury or citizen's panel, in between the successful, ballot, the successful measure and the final ballot. And that citizen's assembly says, here's from the different groups, the interest groups involved, and provides a recommendation to the citizens saying, this information is credible, this information isn't credible. And that goes to all the householders in, in, in Oregon before the assembly, uh, before, the, before the referendum. Um, and I know that Alan and others have suggested that would have been quite a nice process to have gone through before Brexit. Um, but that wasn't, that wasn't how it was done. So I want to just end, end here by saying something is in the... Again, going back to what I said at the start, something is definitely in the air. I think it's a really exciting time, uh, but it's also a slightly dangerous time because I think there's a real rush to be doing citizens' assemblies without the clarity of why we're doing a citizens' assembly. So one of the things I've done on a couple of occasions now is talked a couple of people down on doing a citizens' assembly. Various, you know, a couple of politicians who, and a couple of activists who wanted to do them and said, this isn't, the right, you know, this isn't the right thing to be doing. There are other methods for, do, for, for doing what you want to do. Citizens' assemblies are not a silver bullet. Citizens' assemblies are fantastic at doing a particular job within the political system, but they aren't the answer to all of democracy's ills. So thank you.
So we have a huge amount uh, to get our teeth into there. Um, we are not going to be following uh, Sarah's method of ensuring that everyone is equally uh, able to uh, ask their questions in the room, but uh, we very much encourage anyone who would like to ask a question uh, to do so. Um, just before I uh, start picking uh, people whose hands are up, um, <coughs> I should have said earlier, um, the camera will continue to roll. Um, if you would like not to appear on the film that will go on our website after this, then please just let us know and we will remove you from uh, the film before it goes up on the website. You are free to say your name or not say your name. Uh, as you wish, but we hope that you say your name so that it helps us. Now, most of you, in fact, have your hands up. So, um, <laughs> it's very gendered. Very good. Uh, let me uh, start with uh, the person in white just uh, on the aisle here. Um, I'm Jane Brown. My question is um, really to ask you to say a bit more about when citizens assemble they should not be in, because I felt with the Scottish case that they have a predetermined answer. They clearly want the Scottish assembly to say that the answer is a second referendum and possibly independent. It seems to me if you've got a preset answer, that is when you should not use an assembly. Yep, uh, good point. Uh, gentleman in the t-shirt here, yep. Um, I just wanted to follow up on something that Graham was saying towards the end, um, who is um, recognising that sort of Constitutional, uh, sorry, citizens' assembly seem to be very sort of on brand. Everybody seems to want one. And um, in my borough of Camden, um, you know, one has just been started. Um, right now, this second. Yes, yes. As um, we speak. And yep. there's a, I feel like there's a real danger that while they're meant to be really deliberative and far-reaching processes, that they could be used to try and sort of canvas people rather than involve them in a, a genuine process. And that um, councils who want to sort of tick that box, um, you know, tick the, the CA box, are going to try and <clears throat> essentially sort of, uh, like, yeah, sort of determine the answer before, you know, before the process is even started. So I wonder if you could speak to that danger and how it might be avoided, whether you have a sort of gold standard or a set of criteria that that we really should be pushing for as citizens. Let me stick on this side for now. Uh, lady behind, yeah. Hi. Um, at a time when experts are not in vogue and um, even more piffle is talked by politicians than usual, things, are, things don't always have to make sense at the moment for people to agree with them, to vote for them, to like them. I won't mention various Tory uh, and the Prime Minister at the moment on that. But it's, and it, it just strikes me, and does it strike anyone else, that citizens' assemblies are an incredibly sensible, organised, deliberative process. And this is in opposition to this sort of generalised, emotional response um, that we're getting over a lot of politics. Great, thank you. And finally, in this round, gentlemen at the front. Um, Michael Romberg, London for Europe. Uh, on Brexit, we have all become identified as Remainers or Leavers more than, more than anything else. Um, so, so one question is whether it is already too late uh, to have a citizens' assembly on Brexit. But my, my real question is, I can see how it is a magical process for the participants, and I can see how the conclusions can be disseminated to the wider public, what I don't understand is how the learning process, the understanding each other, the becoming willing to listen to other people, to experts, to different views, how that change in values and attitudes can be disseminated to the public at large. Great questions. Um, thank you. Uh, let's stick with those for now. Shall we go in the order in which you spoke this round, and then we'll shake things up. Sarah's looking alarmed. No, shake things fine. up in future rounds. So, Sarah. Okay, a quick, a quick quiz through them. And um, when should they not be used? Who asked that? When should they not be used? Um, lots of occasions. I'll, I'll add some, and then other people can add others. Um, so, when you want to talk to people about a particular lived experience they have. So, if you want to talk to people affected by, say, knife crime, about knife crime, or about homelessness, about homelessness, you don't use the citizens assembly because that's a representative sample of the public. So, it is unsuitable for the question you are asking. Um, 
when you have a very simple issue and you don't need anything nearly as complex, it is a waste of money. Um, when there is not an opportunity to influence, I think that was implied in your question, but if people have already decided, as with any other method of engagement, you do not engage people on a question asking them their opinion if you have already decided the answer. Do not do it. It just makes things uh, worse. Um, and then if people didn't have... Um, I think cross-party political buy-in is, is also really useful if you want to take things forward. I think also, you see, if a party came out against it, or if, say, one side of the Brexit debate came out against the Citizens' Assembly, and then people who held that affiliation or that view wouldn't take part as participants, you'd have a problem. Or that you know, people wouldn't come as witnesses, be a problem. Um, what do you, uh, canvas and ticks box and not, and not a proper process, uh, I think it is a risk. Um, I think the other risk locally is that people don't have enough money to run a full citizens' assembly. And I think what I'd encourage people to do is a bit like Graham said, there are other processes like citizens' juries that can be used meaningfully on, on a local level. And I think I'd encourage people to think about, you know, what they want to engage people on and what is the best method that fits within their time and resources to do that meaningfully. And um, I have published a blog, we have published a blog as involved um, on a kind of a set of criteria and standards for climate assemblies. Um, and that's something we're hoping to, to publish a bit more and do a bit more work on. Um, do I think it's in opposition to the general political mood? Yes and no. I mean, there's suddenly loads of citizens' assemblies cropping up, so there's different elements to it. I'd also say that while citizens' assemblies are very factual, clearly people do bring in their values and their emotions mm. and so on to the process. So it's not a, it's not a case of like evidence versus, versus emotion, uh, although I take your general point. Um, Brexit, whether it's already too late, well, that is an excellent question. Um, I'd say the main thing that my, would be my concern is on Brexit, I mean, apart from what question... So you'd have to get... So it, it's the politics, really. Could you get agreement on what question would be asked? And would anybody listen to the answer would be my main question on that. Uh, and if the answer is yes, then great. Um, and then how can the learning and understanding um, be disseminated to the public at large? It is a really interesting question. Um, I know that there are um, some production companies who are interested in talking to TV production companies, interested in talking to the select committees about the climate change process in the autumn, which would at least mean it kind of went could mean it went out kind of much wider on TV. Certainly um, the making the resources, kind of all the speakers things, you, you make all the speeches that um, take place, you, you can make them publicly available. We already do, I think, well, generally we do, we put them up on the website, we film them, put them up on the website, um, and all of the resources are public. You could see that you could do packs where people could participate at home and, and that kind of thing, but then participating at home doesn't really do it because you're still just talking to people you know, even though you might have divergent views. So it's not massively been cracked, uh, that one, but you, you could see there are, there are ways. Sarah's given us a very full answer there, so uh, um, if there are additional points that others would like to make. Um, just really quickly, so I don't think necessarily they're useful in all aspects of the select committee's work, so scrutinising the implementation of policy or whether a policy is right, I don't know that a citizen's assembly would help with that, so we shouldn't use it for everything. Um, I think really importantly, we shouldn't use them where there's no appetite for some action, because if people invest loads of time and effort in participating in a citizen's assembly and nothing happens, then that is going to leave people feeling really cynical and rightly uh, so. And really to pick up the, the second question as well, which is um, what if you've already determined the answer before you begin? Well, don't ask a question if you're not prepared to listen to what people have to say. If you've already made your mind up, strike me, that's, uh, that would be the definition of uh, pointless. And again, it would just make people... Uh, feel cynical. Um, I, I take the point about is it the opposite of politics as it is at the moment and I suppose what I would say, and well I would say this wouldn't I because I chair a select committee, is whilst a lot of the stuff that's happening over in Parliament at the moment feels really um, futile, irrelevant, annoying, is I actually think the select committees are doing really good and useful work. So I think that um, the idea of evidence-based policy making, of seeking expert opinion of not thinking that we're sick of experts. Actually, we quite like hearing from experts and interrogating experts and building uh, recommendations on them. That feels to me like a really good thing. And there's a lot of it happening. And the select committees have become more powerful and perhaps more influential. And we're looking 
you know, we're doing ourselves amongst the select committees. We're reflecting on 40 years of, uh, of the select committees and thinking, how can we uh, do our work uh, even better? So actually, whilst it might be the opposite of politics as normal at a headline level, I actually think there's lots of things happening that are very much in tune um, with this. And I think the, precisely that question, really, which is how do you widen out the discussion and the learning that goes on in a citizens' assembly and use that to, you know, to transform the discussion that is going to happen in the wider public debate? I, that's precisely one of the questions I asked today. So <laughs> we're thinking in the same way. And precisely your point that s s select committees are doing great work. You know, all the research suggests that select committees are doing great work, but many people are not aware of it. It illustrates the difficulty that citizens' assemblies have. It's, yeah. it's, just, it's just the same kind of problem, really. Just make a couple of quick comments because uh, I think what's been said is right. So on the, the second question, um, it, it feels there's a danger of what happened in the 1990s with new Labour and citizens juries which were um, overused and for the wrong things um, and then mis uh, misappropriated. There is a real problem up here which um, Sarah will recognise which is the danger of lowest bid in the lowest bid for a tender you know their, their capacity is not huge in the at the moment because this is a, this suddenly expanded and suddenly there aren't that many providers and suddenly there are a few cowboys on the cowboys coming in saying well we can deliver it for half the price and if you're a cash strapped um, local authority then you'll probably go for the in fact sometimes you legally have to go for the lowest and so there's going to have to be some really important stuff which is really dull around procurement and making sure that these things are procured with standards and that is not, you know, we, it's hard to get people on the streets for procurement. But, but you know, we, that, that is actually, I'm trying to persuade XR that they should, you know, their next thing should be about the standards of uh, procurement standards, but haven't quite done it yet. Um, um, the wider public question, is it too late? Sorry, I, I think what Sarah said is, is right. It's about getting, is there, is there the time and the political support for this to happen? Um, if you get those conditions, it's not too late. But, but, you know, but is, if that's the case. The wider public, there is some emerging research that suggests, and it's limited, but the emerging research suggests that when people know about a citizens' assembly, and it, uh, they tend to uh, support its recommendations uh, more than people who haven't, if you see what I mean. So the very knowledge about it. One of the problems is people don't know about it. So when the British Columbia Citizens' Assembly was asked to um, deal with electoral reform, um, there was a vote on its proposition and it, was required, it had a super majority threshold, so it got 57% of the vote, the referendum, but it needed to get 60. But what became clear was most people didn't, or a significant amount of people in British Columbia didn't even know there'd been a citizens' assembly. And those people were less likely to support it. When people did know about it, I think they were twice as likely to support the recommendation. So there is, a, there is evidence that people accept, and this seems to be for two reasons. There's a kind of populist reason. These are people like myself. These are everyday folks. They aren't politicians. They're not the political class. There's a kind of everydayness about it. And the other reason is these people have spent a lot of time thinking about this issue, way more than I have, way more than most other people have. So I'm going to take, and, and I, you know, the process looks good. So there are different reasons why people are, are supportive of it. It does need publicity. The problem is, I don't know how to say this, um, citizens' assemblies aren't sexy. Um, I don't, it's a horrible thing to say, but, you know, it's not that newsworthy, 50 to 100 people in a room trying to get on with each other. That is not what our political press likes. So there is a real issue here about selling citizens' assemblies. And I'm not quite sure we've cracked that one. And I, and I know, I mean, it really worked well in Ireland because it was the abortion issue. Um, but on other, other issues, I'm not quite sure. So, Sorry? It worked well, it worked well in Ireland. So there, there are examples where it can, it can work. But we've got a breakthrough... And one of the interesting things with The Guardian, which has recently come round to citizens' assemblies, was just talking to their, one of their lead editors who said, I didn't really, really know anything about citizens' assemblies. I've been so caught up with the Brexit stuff, I didn't, hadn't recognised all this stuff had happened. And this is a lead, one of the lead political editors from our major national newspapers. It just what isn't on the agenda for them. So it's taken a, there's a lot of political education. But six months ago, a year ago, if I went into Parliament and said citizens' assemblies... I reckon there would have been about a dozen, 20 members of parliament who would have said, oh yeah, I know what that is. Now there's a, now there's, you know, a large swathe of them who know what it is and an even larger swathe who think they know what it is <laughs> but, and, and that, but actually haven't quite caught up. But you know, th there is, that's a changing environment in itself. The fact that politicians are talking about this 
means that we are in a different politics now. Great. I'm going to come over to this side of the room now. Um, so let's see if we can do quick questions and quick answers in particular. <laughs> For me. Um, <laughs> um, lady in the second row? Yes. yes. Oh, I'm Corinne Lodzo from the Remaking Democracy Alliance. Um, I just wondered if you, because you've been talking really almost entirely about citizens' assemblies as part of the existing political process or feeding into it, can you envisage assemblies that are not part of the existing political process and that function outside of it and have, but still are able to? <coughs> find a way of implementing their decisions? That's question number one. Second one is, who decides the questions? Hmm. Interesting. And in front? Hi, uh, I'm Lucy and I'm a research assistant at Constitution Unit and I wanted to ask you about some of the limitations of citizens' assembly. So obviously you were talking about all the benefits um, and actually in some of the academic literature and I suppose some of the more extreme proponents of citizens' assemblies want to say let's just get rid of Parliament, let's just have citizens' assemblies run everything. So can you tell us about the limitations and why you think, or if you think, that should happen, or why it shouldn't And you'd better give Lucy a good answer, because she's live-tweeting. <laughs> <this>, uh, <laughs> so, um, gentleman there. Uh, uh, John Newton. Um, to, to what extent can you align the experts in a citizen assembly to the experts that politicians are exposed to, because the get-out clause for the politicians will be that there's some reason that the uh, advice doesn't need to be followed. And so that's quite a difficult one to square, isn't it? Does the Secretary of State for Education have a source of information that they are using to make decisions, as opposed to an assembly on education, for example? And can you align those two things? Is there a methodology? Huh. And gentleman in the middle? Yep. Yep. Thank you. Tom Cohen, UCL Transport Institute. It's not transport, it's you saying transport studies, sorry, branding issue there. <laughs> <laughs> a suggestion as to how to make Citizens Assembly sexy would be to call them Citizens Assembly Love Island. <laughs> <laughs> but a serious question, which is having been involved recently in trying to develop some assembly work on automated vehicles, it feels as if it's practically impossible to develop truly neutral stimulus material for the participants. Am I wrong? And if I'm not, how can we be sure that there aren't framing effects in this process? <laughs> Okay, we've got still, still got quite a few hands up. Shall we see if we can do really quick answers? And um, do really quick answers. Yeah, go. I want to do really quick answers. On sortition legislatures. <laughs> you can do it. <laughs> uh, Lillian, do you want to kick us off? Uh, well, I'm not going to try to answer all of them, but uh, I think the, the question about who decides the questions is a really good one because it's, you know, as with all things, the person who commissions it, the person who's got funding, decides what the questions are, aren't they? So, that, so there's still a, a, a massive power issue there, which is, you know, the person in the street can't decide to commission a, a citizen's assembly, so you have to have access to resource. Um, so I suppose the answer is it's people who are, who've got access to resources for whatever um, recent reasons. Uh, I, I mean, I'm not going to stray on the... In terms of limitations, I'm sure the experts on citizens' assemblies can explain, but one of the issues for me is... However you construct it, are there people who are excluded or whose voices have... Well, are there people who are excluded just because of the process in itself that people who would self-select out not to do it because, my goodness, you'd have to go to, into a room full of strangers in such and such a place, and particularly people, perhaps I don't know, who, for, who, who, whose reading skills are very poor or would just find that, or people who've got... Um, particular neurodiverse conditions or you know that would I think those things would be really challenging and even if you measure for who's for equality of speaking time whose issues get picked up because the women in the room will recognize sometimes probably that you've been in a meeting and you've said something and no one takes any notice until the bloke next to you says exactly the same thing I'll and then suddenly say, it's a really good idea <laughs> um, so how do, how do you make sure it's really properly representative and that everybody, particularly those from most marginal groups, get a say? Um, and I thought the question about should they hear the same evidence as decision makers is a really interesting one. Um, but essentially, decision makers are still the person who makes 
the decision. So does that does that help? I don't know. Um, yes, that's my attempt. Sorry. Great, Graham. Okay. God, I like talking about this stuff. It's really hard. Yeah, quickly. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are examples of people trying to do these things independently. Let's pick, pick that up later. There's no reason that a social movement or a community couldn't use this as a way of part of their decision-making process. But I wouldn't use a citizens' assemblies. There are other methodologies. Um, who decides the question? I, Oregon, East Belgium, Madrid decided by citizens. Or different, there are other ways of doing it. Um, but, there, but that's a minority, minority practice at the moment. So and legislatures which is basically what we were saying about should we remove all the politicians and put randomly selected citizens in. Um, the problem with that is it assumes that they're all going to act differently within that, within that institution. If you remember what sortition was brought in in Athens, um, along with rapid rotation of positions. So no one in Athens held a position of power often for more than a day, sometimes only for a few weeks, and then they were rotated in. One of the problems with the sortition legislature is people are saying three to four year terms for randomly selected citizens. The other thing that they did in Athens was they ensured each of their institutions had a clear task. So you need to have rotation, sortition, and clarity of mandate all need to come together. And that is not what a legislature does. So there are other models. We can, again, pick it up. Aligning experts to advisors. I would, again, refer to what happens in Poland. Uh, it's an interesting one where people buy into what the assembly is going to recommend. Um, one of the problems here is there is too much room for manoeuvre when the recommendations come out for politicians to cherry pick the ones they like. Um, as I say, the practice in Poland is where there's an almost majority within the assembly, that gets implemented. So there's one way of, one way of dealing with that problem. And the, val the neutral thing, there's no such thing as neutral evidence. As you, you know, I think the important thing is you have an advisory body which covers different political interests that sees that the, bo the body of information that's given is reasonable and fair. I don't think you can get any better than that. Sarah? Uh, yeah, so assemblies uh, not being part of the process, um, no reason why you couldn't do it, but you may struggle for impact. I don't know of one that's happened outside of a decision-making process that has succeeded in having an impact. Um, limitations, I'll, I'll go for another one related to the point of having a whole chamber done by sortition, um, which is that if you think about the amount of effort that goes into making a topic accessible and considered and putting together all the evidence for a citizens' assembly, if you had to do that on every issue that the uh, like say for example the House of Lords was having to consider, you couldn't possibly do it, right? Like not that level of prep. So I think people underestimate the level of thinking and work that has to has to go into people to make these issues accessible. Um, could you align the evidence? Um, so the way that it works is that you get kind of the expert leaders who are experts in the field and they advise you on what evidence people need to hear and then you bring in the key experts. Um, and there was quite a lot of overlap, for example, in Citizens Assembly and Social Care and who the committee heard from in oral evidence <coughs> and who the citizens heard from in the Assembly. I mean, it's short of someone turning around and saying, no, I don't do, can't do it or no, I'm not free, in which case they hopefully they could send you someone else. There is no reason. That's how it that's how it works. I uh, haven't got a better answer than that. Um, I agree with Graham. Nothing is truly neutral. It's a case of putting in as many checks and balances as you can to make it as balanced as possible. Um, there is somewhere in the world, and I've forgotten who it was, and Graham will know me. There, there, no, know me? Will, will know the answer. You? Yeah, you do know me. Um, they, this, is her, um, this is her third or fourth meeting today <laughs> at the Assembly, so you know. Um, where they're looking at having like a list of people who can run citizens' assemblies and then kind of randomly selecting them to run particular ones to try and take out and uh, insert another level of randomness. Whether that is a good idea or not, I, I'm not sure. Do you think we can squeeze in one final quick round of questions? Uh, <coughs> so... <laughs> Um, very quickly then. Uh, so um, there's one here. Yep. Yep. Um, Nick Eric and Lambert of the Liberal Democrats. Um, very quick question, just on costs. Could you could someone actually just put some figures? Hundred and fifty uh, k for two weekends. For with fifty two hundred two weekends with fifty people. And the total cost of the entire process, for example, for the for the Irish. Um, I don't know. That was the total cost of the Citizens' Assembly on social care. I don't know that because I ran it. I didn't run the island one. Total so, cost. Great. yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, 
1.5 million euros in Ireland. Yeah. Uh, there's one at the back, I think. Yep. Yes, yep. Right at the front. Thank you. Uh, John Young, um, sounds as if not for the first time that the Irish are teaching the English, the Scots, and the Welsh a few tricks. But my understanding uh, from Joanna Cherry is that they've had one or two stumbling blocks there because there's a disagreement over the idea. Um, citizens' assemblies, would they necessarily be, um, um, uh, the members, would they necessarily be elected or would it be a little bit like jury service? People Just like know, jury service. That people yeah. are, no, have been chosen at random. Yeah. And then, uh, I suppose the, the crunch issue is the relationship between citizens' assemblies, which I will presumably continue to be subordinate to the legislature, shortcomings of which have prompted this whole argument in the first place. Good. And one final one from over here. A gentleman here, yeah. Um, my name's George. Uh, I'm from Hastings Room, but in Lambeth. Um, the, the, in Lambeth, the proposal is that the Citizens Assembly will discuss how to decarbonise most things in Lambeth, including like stuff in hospitals and articulate demands of central government and business and individuals. Yet yeah, it's the local authority that's commissioning it. Should Is, is that a mismatch, or should the Citizens Assembly like, make recommendations for the body that commissioned it? Great, thank you. Um, very quickly, please. <laughs> Graham. Um, and with that one, there's no reason that um, you, you can't go across a range of different institutions within Lambeth, but the question then is what's going to happen as we will take it up. Um, so we, we can talk about that afterwards. I just want to just quickly talk about the cost issue. I guess for me, what cost good decisions? What cost good democracy? Um, you know, I think we don't invest in our civic infrastructure enough, so I don't think, I think these things are expensive, but when you've got a, an issue that is politically deadlocked um, and you're going round and round in circles, it seems to me a, a, good, a good investment. Um, and uh, the Lambeth issue about um, current budgets, you can um, set the question such that working within current budgets, what can we do? But you also can ask people to say, and if we could do more, what should we do? You know, you can kind of, that can be set up. People are, I, I, I don't want to say they become the animals of the political, pro, of political institutions, but they are, they are more sympathetic to the positions, that, the, the, the kind of context within your working. So I think that's about how you set up the process. So I think, I think that's possible to do it, to do that. Um, so just coming back on the question about cost over here, so the £150,000 is, is the right figure. Now, the majority of costs of that are like putting people up overnight, paying for their travel, paying for their incentives. So if you were running a local process, you wouldn't have a lot yeah. of those costs. Yeah. Um, so if you want something like budget headings to think about so people could go home, you wouldn't necessarily have to buy them dinner, their transport costs would be minimal, it would be a lot cheaper than that. Can I just um, jump in on that one? Because yeah. the ones that are run in Poland, they, they run them... On Saturdays, one Saturday, then another one a few days, a few weeks later. So they're one day, they're one day at a time that people have to come. So it just that just skins the budget. You know, really affects the budget by yeah, not having to be in a hotel. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, if you want to ask us for budget headings to think about, we can email you some budget headings. Um, also, I'd say on, on the local processes and, and the, the budget. You know, citizens' assemblies, we've said it before, aren't the only valid way of doing public engagement on this issue. You might want to use a jury, it's got 10 or 15 people, well, 12 to 15 people probably, um, then you're only paying 12 to 15 people in incentive payment rather than 50. You, do you know, like, 
think about it, it, citizen assemblies are in fashion as it, as it was said they are not the only way of doing things particularly locally um, and on the question here um, if you're making recommendations that are involving institutions and not just the ones that are commissioning I would strongly consider putting those other institutions on an advisory Absolutely. panel for Absolutely. the process um, and you also want some input into them right so to make sure that, that what, what people are considering is, is kind of reflecting the reality of their situation and so on but you definitely want them as stakeholders in the process from early on and Lillian I'm not sure what there's left uh, to answer. I mean, I think the, the, this issue about, you know, when you've got limited um, resources, and, and you're right, it's true across the whole of uh, local government. I mean, I think the Citizens' Assembly is really, hard, really good, actually, at saying, OK, these are the hard choices you've got to make within this budgetary constraint. What would, what would you do? Actually, you know, I can see from the point of view of elected councillors who at the moment are having to make impossible choices. That's quite, a, that's quite pleasing. Although maybe, you know, you might think, well, why did I let my councillor if, if they're going to give me the tricky choices to make? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and the second thing, I suppose, on that, which is if your manifesto made you, means you've made certain commitments, then, you know, are you going to be willing to implement what the Citizens' Assembly says? So don't ask people a question if you have already decided, if you, if you couldn't implement the answer to it. Um, and then the third bit, which I suppose is answering George's question, which is if, if Lambeth are consulting on something that is about government um, policy, then... It might be a useful contribution, but the government might just go, well, you would, you know, you might say that in Lambeth, but hey, we've got to hear from, mm. you know, hundreds of other local authorities. So I kind of just would question what the value is of asking about things that you're not in a position to do anything with. That, I, yeah, I didn't pick that up in your question, but if you're running a process locally, keep it focused on what can be changed locally, because that's what people locally have the power to actually do. Well, that's just, just on that, there's an interesting issue about for example, what what a particular council might lobby government. So, for example, around planning, if you know there are certain yeah. things. You, so you can also learn. That, yeah. That's true, yeah. but but I guess in a time where you might have limited yeah. time to get people to think yeah. about things and so on. Yeah, I can see that. I, I would tend to prioritise yeah. the things that could be acted on locally, unless yeah. it's explicitly about what should we be lobbying government yeah. about. Yeah. Yeah. Right, that has been a fascinating discussion. We have thought a great deal about what citizens' assemblies are good for, but also lots of really interesting stuff, I thought, about um, where citizens' assemblies might not be uh, the best approach. And as we have this, this wave, this fashion, as Lillian put it, uh, I think it's really important that we remember as well um, both sides of that argument. Before I ask you to thank our speakers, just a couple of quick notes. Firstly, if you want to read more about these things, here are a few Constitution Unit um, reports from recently that address these matters. Actually, we don't have the Citizens' Assembly on Brexit report up there. But the, uh, go to our website and you will find the report of the Citizens' Assembly on Brexit and these various other reports that also... Sorry? We had a really interesting discussion in the Citizens' Assembly on Brexit, and it, as, as Paul says, it came up with some very coherent and uh, many people would say sensible uh, answers. Um, and finally, we will be holding further events at the Constitution Unit. We're hoping to hold one later this month on the subject of Parliament and Brexit, which is quite a big one. So do... Something's happening. So do sign up to our mailing list so that you can find further details of that as they are announced. But please let me uh, ask you to join me in thanking our wonderful speakers tonight.